Hi, this is Kara Swisher, and I want to talk to you about my new podcast for The New York Times called Sway. If you want to know what people who hold power in our world are really all about, you need to hear how they answer the tough questions. And that is my specialty. And although it might get messy, as it always does, it's also going to be really fun. You can get Sway wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes are available Mondays and Thursdays. Hello, everybody. Steve Politi from NJ Advanced Media, and welcome back to the Rutgers Rant. Joined, as always, James Cratch, Keith Sargent, and fellas, I was thinking today... If we had a podcast, what would we talk about? Is there anything to talk about? And then it dawned on me, hey, you know what? We could talk about football. I mean, what, what a crazy idea for a football podcast, right? I mean, who, who would have thought that we could actually, you know, have a football conversation, right? Football. I don't even know what that is at, at this point. <laughs> it's, what are we talking it's crazy. about? I know it's crazy, but let's do it. Uh, you know, some developments. Finally, we have a, we have another schedule, eight game slate starting on October 24th at Michigan state, you know, Cratch, you wrote this the other day and I, I just completely agree with you. It's just about the most favorable schedule that Greg Schiano could have gotten here. I mean, finally the big 10 decided to punish somebody else and hilariously, hilariously took the club to Nebraska after it's suing the league. Um, <laughs> You know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's still hard. It's still hard to, you know, get, get a bunch of wins out of this thing. But at least it's not just the wrecking ball schedule that it could have been. And the, like the first one, when they, excuse me, the second schedule they released. Mm -hmm. uh, so what were your thoughts overall on it? No, I think, first off, you start with that game at Michigan State, which has got a little juice to it. You know, two for, you know, new head coaches, a little bit of recruiting heat between the programs. Rutgers has kind of been competitive with, with Michigan State the last two seasons. I think the biggest thing is every year it seemed like in November, Rutgers would get Michigan and Penn State back to back. Or that, I think 2018, that brutal, you know, month where they had Michigan, Penn State, Michigan State, and Wisconsin all in November. That's broken up. There's a, a buffer game in between all the big boys that Rutgers has to play this year. Right. And obviously, as I'm sure we'll get to in a second, they drop Nebraska off the schedule, the original schedule. Uh, I still think they're going to play Nebraska at the end of the year, but they do drop that. And obviously, Nebraska is a better football team, than my, in my opinion, than Illinois and Purdue. Um, which, so, I, yes, it, it's as manageable as could get. Now, are they going to win many games? I'm still skeptical, but when Big Ten schedule 2.0 came out, I thought they were headed towards 0-10. Now I'm thinking, hey, they might win a game or two. Sorry, do you agree with that? I agree. Um, I, I, like I said on the, on the last podcast, I, I, I kind of look at the, the way he's turned over this roster, the, the amount of transfers that, he, that he's brought in, um, perhaps a, you know, a stiffer uh, quarterback competition than we've seen in the past. I think it all equates to maybe a team that could, could, can surprise. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the key is at least, you know, you look at these these games. Of course, there's still the Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, where you expect a blowout. Uh, but at least there's a chance to be competitive against Illinois and Purdue. Uh, and and to me, that that's going to be the bar that you you you're going to want to see from this team this year. All right, this is Chicano's first year under crazy circumstances nobody is expecting a bowl game no one's expecting a lot of victories you know can they compete against the teams that they're eventually going to have to climb over in the big 10 standings and the fact that you you know you have a couple games like in illinois and a purdue on there and in addition to maryland which you know we we all agree could be you know in for a world to hurt as well uh, even michigan state and i knew you picked them to beat michigan state crash which is uh you know i've, I've made that mistake before before a 45 to 3 loss uh <laughs> in in east lansing i, I would, would never do it again uh what was your rationale there were you, were you, were you just you just decided you you're feeling a little frisky you know <laughs> that's what it comes back to it's just you know actually i picked them to beat michigan state last year and they lost 27 nothing so i've also been there no it's just the idea of it's the first game of the year it's you know a new head coach there's a motivational angle that shiano and his staff can kind of play and i and i'll be honest too like the idea that like you know obviously in 2004 the michigan state upset was kind of shiano's first you know signature signature moment at Rutgers. We're going to hear all about those good vibes. Sarge is going to get Ryan Neal on the phone at some point before the <laughs> And, you know. Don't tell people my coverage plan. <laughs> Come on. So I just thought, like, if there's a moment where they're going to get a win, this could be uh, the perfect storm set up. You know, there's not going to be any fans there. So I, as I've t I told a couple of our NJ.com slash tech subscribers, I don't think home – 
road really matters this year unless you go to Nebraska and there's 30,000 family members in the stadium. Yeah, I just think that's that's a matchup they can win. Uh, I don't think they're going to beat Purdue or Illinois. Just because, one, I think Illinois is actually going to be – I don't know if the record's going to show it. I think one of the things we're going to have to deal with the Big Ten is that the records, you know, given the kind of gauntlet and the weird schedule we have, records going to be weird. You know, Iowa might go 4-4 four and four and be in the top 25, something like that. I think Illinois is a good football team, and I think Purdue is going to be – like Rutgers, you know, near the bottom of the West Division, they're probably going to be desperate in that Thanksgiving Day game. That might be their best chance for a win this season. Uh, But I do think they beat Maryland. I mean, I think the biggest thing with Maryland is Rutgers is going to be better coached than Maryland. And then you get to that crossover game. I think the schedules kind of kind of maybe screw Rutgers at the end with the rule they have about the rematch clause in the crossover games that end of the season week. But I do think that Michigan State is their best chance to kind of come out and score a win that gets people talking. Talking. I still think the, the, the primary question here, though, is, is really not uh, how many wins or losses. It's how many games still get played. And I know, you know, we, we, tend, to, we tend to forget that we're in a pandemic. It's, I know it's amazing. It's still going on, but it is. Uh, you know, having Wake Forest, Notre Dame game canceled this weekend was, was, a, was a big red flag. I don't know if you saw this, but the Michigan State, the, the county health officer in, 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 in East Lansing, uh, Expressed, it actually said that she would absolutely tell the university to call off the game given the current volume of COVID cases if it were being played now. So, and you have to remember what Rutgers said. I mean, the statement they issued was pretty clear that they're not going to put this team, they're going to go week by week, and they're not going to put this team in a situation uh, that could jeopardize the health of the entire campus. Um, so, Sarge, when, you know, it, w- what's your feeling on, on games played? I think if you just look at what's going on nationwide, I mean, you mentioned the Notre Dame Wake Forest game, but you know, there's been a dozen other postponements. I, I, I think we're going to look at a season where we're going to see postponements. I mean, I don't think there's any way around it. I mean, Rutgers gave, you know, remember that statement. They gave themselves, you know, a clear out, you know, in which they said that if there's an issue on campus, you're forgetting. I mean, that I, I saw the Michigan state um, release too. And, you know, if the health official has, has, has some apprehension right now, I'm sure people above Greg Schiano's pay, uh, pay grade, Pat Hobbs's pay grade are going to look at it and be like, mm, maybe not so fast. Um, and I think it's going to be the case for, for a lot of Big Ten schools as well. Sorry, go ahead, Gretch. I was going to say, I think that the biggest issue is you look at that Notre Dame shutdown. They have 13 total kids either testing positive or in quarantine. That's not a major amount of your roster, but they had seven positives. So if this is a Big Ten team, you now have seven kids around for three weeks. And yes, your rapid testing in theory should allow you to kind of nip these sort of things in the bud. But at the same time, if a kid has the coronavirus, just a trace of it in his body, he's sidelined for three weeks. I think that's going to be the Big Ten's biggest issue is that, one, if you have a breakout that kind of happens, you know, right after a game, now suddenly you're taking two teams involved and you're, it was now South Florida has shut down practice because I assume – and, and good on Notre Dame, it, the way that South Florida release indicated that Notre Dame informed South Florida about what kids had the virus, what kids were in quarantine, so then South Florida could use their game tape and do some, you know, contact tracing and figure out, okay, which of their players had, you know, tackled or got tackled by those players. Now South Florida's got to shut down. I just think it can become – everything is great, but if one – and we've learned this, the virus can penetrate pretty much any kind of wall we put up against it. If it gets in yep. once, it could create a colossal set of dominoes for the Big Ten. Yep, and that's and that's sort of what we're barreling toward. Uh, all right, well, let's just assume they're going to play some games. And, you know, I, I thought it would be fun to just break down the positions on the team. We haven't done that yet. Uh, I know it's difficult because we don't have a roster yet, which is, which is still sort of incredible a month away from games. So, you know, we might be uh, using some players who – aren't on the team, but I think we have a pretty good idea of who's going to be on the team. Let's go through each position, and, and you know, I'd like to see what you guys think. Is the position much better than last year, somewhat better than last year, the same as last year, or even worse than last year? So um, let's start with quarterbacks. Of course, Noah Vedral comes in from Nebraska, uh, another transfer. I, I, my sources in Nebraska <laughs> tell me that they like this kid. He's accurate. He fits the offense well, uh, but we've seen what happens with these quarterback transfers. We haven't had a lot of success. Uh, last year, obviously, McLean Carter was the guy who came in and disappeared pretty quick overnight. Uh, you still have Art Zikowski, Johnny Langdon. Cratch, what do you think? Is, is the quarterback position better than last year, same or worse? 
I think it's better just because I think Noah Vedrill is a guy who is a you know Big Ten caliber quarterback who kind of fits what we expect Sean Gleason's offense to look like. And and if hey if you have him and Art beats him out, that means Art has made major strides as well. So I think between Art and, and Vedrill, as I wrote in my mailbag, you're going to have a guy win the quarterback battle, whether it's you know in training camp or by the end of this kind of strange season, who's probably going to be your starter for the next two seasons potentially because everyone's getting you know a free year. So I think that's the, the great thing Rutgers has is no matter where they land at quarterback, they're getting a multi-year starter in all likelihood. Sarge, you agree? Yeah, it's going to be better. I'm I, I'm more more interested in in what the quarterback position kind of entails under Sean Gleason. Right. You know, is it going to be a dual threat guy? You know, it, 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 to me that that's going to be the bigger bigger question. We don't know what the offense is even going to look like. Um, yeah. But from a competition standpoint, you know, not not, not to sound put uh, do too much coach coach speak, but they will all, always tell you that competition competition kind of breeds breed success. So. I expect it to be more of a competition than, than, than years past. And, you know, and I, I wouldn't uh, count out R. Sikowski. Again, like I said, I think, uh, the, you know, the kid has uh, you know, shown gra- gradual improvement. I think uh, the kid has a chance. Right. All right. And I, I certainly agree somewhat better, at least. Uh, I remember the, the season ended with Johnny Langan uh, playing and we, we didn't even really counting him in as a, as, a, as a potential starter in this situation. So I think that tells you all you need to know. All right. Jumping to running back, still probably the most uh, talented, strongest position in the team. Certainly one of the most talented. Isaiah Pacheco, probably the best player in the team. 729 yards last year, seven touchdowns. You have Aaron Young behind him, Karon Adams, but no Raheem Blackshear. Cratch, is this position somewhat better, much better, or about the same as last year? I'll say about the same. I mean, I, it should be a little bit better because obviously, you know, Pacheco, you hope, takes a step forward. Aaron Young takes a step forward. Karon Adams sees, you know, more work. But, I, you know, obviously you add some talented, you know, incoming, you know, freshmen like uh, Monagai from, from Don Bosco, uh, the kid from New Rochelle, Jesse Parsons, although we'll see how much they play. But, yeah, I think they should be slightly better, but not a major difference, uh, you know, going forward. I think the, the best thing they can hope for is that they kind of don't really miss Blackshear, which they did last year. Sarge, you agree? Yeah, um, I'll say about the same, uh, but I will say this. Uh, Greg Schiano talking to him, you know, throughout the summer, you know, he thinks that there's two positions where they have Big Ten talent, and running back is one of them. So, um, Isaiah Pacheco, I do expect him to t- take another step forward. You know, it, it is – mind-boggling to me that they have not had a thousand yard rusher since 2012 since wow, yeah. Juwan Jameson uh, did it um, and you know they that really I you know I'll be interested again to see you know how the offense takes advantage of the depth you know whether Sean Gleason wants a bell cow or whether he wants to you know do uh, backfield by committee they do have a lot of depth though Right. All right. Going from the strongest position to perhaps the weakest position, pass catchers. I'm going to group them all together, tight ends, wide receivers. Crash is interesting. You had Giovanni Haskins, uh, the transfer from West Virginia, uh, getting the starting nod over uh, Matt Olimo. Um, you know, obviously they've got the same, same names we had before, Bo Melton, Aaron Krushank transferring in, Isaiah Washington. Uh, is this going to be an improvement this year, Cratch? Over, you know, it's just amazing. And this stat just blew me away that they, they had five touchdown receptions in 2019, which is more than the previous two years combined. I just can't, just, that just blows me away. Is this an improvement? Uh, it, it better be. You know, I, I think that, <laughs> The one I, they have a couple things going for them. I think one for all the the bad recruiting that Chris Ash and his staff did at wide receiver, I think there's a chance that they kind of left the new staff. You know, Stanley King and Isaiah Washington. I think you know I know Isaiah Washington played a lot last year, didn't do a whole heck of a lot, but obviously the offense was so limited. I, I do think those are two guys who have a bright future. You add Aaron Crookshank. I think you have to be kind of apprehensive is not the right word. I think the fact of the matter is I wouldn't expect him to be a massive, you know, game changer at receiver from day one, just because, you know, he didn't do a whole heck of a lot as a receiver at Wisconsin. And you have to think that if he, they Wisconsin thought he could provide something, he would have seen more of a role at receiver. I think he's obviously, you know, game breaker, all Big Ten caliber, return man. You hope that Bo Melton, you know, this is finally a big senior year for him. You know, as for Limo, I just think he played a lot last year. 
you know, with Jonathan Lewis getting hurt, you know, Vokalek leaving, the Kia Griffin Stewart leaving, and he just it just never really clicked for him. So I do think a guy like Haskins, who who's had had some success at the Power Five level, takes that job. You know, Jonathan Lewis is supposedly 100 percent healthy. Kind of intrigued to see what he can do now that he has had a you know potentially a year to kind of learn a position under him. But I, I will say better, and I, I think last thing I'll say. You know, I think Underwood, that coaching, I, I've heard a lot of good things about the work he's doing, you know, with the receivers. I, I think that could be a big step forward for this group as well. So I'll say they're better, but they have to be better if this program is going to start moving forward. Right. right. Absolutely. Sarge, and I, this is a question I'll pose to you. Do you agree? And are we missing somebody? I mean, it just seems like this is a this is a position where, you know, somebody we're not not on top of the radar. Maybe that kid Stanley King, who we, we saw last yep. year in training camp, is someone else going to step into this position? I think it's, I think it's possible. Um, you know, but I do think that, uh, you know, uh, Krushenk is a guy who, who, again, I mean, they're expecting big things from, um, you know, uh, Isaiah Washington came, uh, came on, you know, as a, as a freshman, we thought, we thought, and then Bo Melton too. I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, you saw him get uh, gradually better. Um, you know, tight end, I think, I think, uh, Cratch hit the nail on the head. I think if you're talking about, uh, the 10, you know, positions, I think tight end might be the weakest uh, group or at least uh, certainly the uh, position of the most question marks. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that overall the wide receiver uh, group, again, Taekwon Underwood, who, who, you know, I've heard the same things. I mean, I think, you know, he, he, you know, he has the ability to really uh, get the best out of, the, out, out of this group. I think uh, they have the potential to be better. All right, offensive line. This is one that I, I major questions. Obviously, huge losses: Zach Maneski, Kamal Seymour, Mike May. Uh, it wasn't great last year. Now you're putting a lot of new guys into into different different uh, roles. Kratz, you had it broken down: left tackle, right Quan O'Neill, left guard Reggie Sutton, center C.J. Hansen, right guard Nick Creeman, and uh, right tackle the transfer. You go transfer uh, Cedric Pallant. What do you think? Is is there a chance that he can, he can pull something together with this group? Hi, this is Kara Swisher, and I want to talk to you about my new podcast for the New York Times called Sway. If you want to know what people who hold power in our world are really all about, you need to hear how they answer the tough questions. And that is my specialty. And although it might get messy, as it always does, it's also going to be really fun. You can get Sway wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes are available Mondays and Thursdays. It's going to be tough. Andrew Oreck has got his work cut out for him. I think that, you know, obviously losing Maietti was a big blow. Mike Maietti, I've said this before, he is the only recruit and develop success of the Chris Ash era. <laughs> You know, and I think it's second straight year, you know, a, a starting offensive lineman goes in the transfer portal and, you know, all the message, well, oh, not a big deal. Well, now Jonah Jackson's, you know, kicking ass for the Detroit Lions and Mike Maietti goes to an SEC program. So I, I think that it's going to be very tough. I think Pallant's going to be the big guy because, you know, in the past, you know, Rutgers brought in, you know, has brought in Juco guy under Ash, didn't work out. I think they need him to step in. You know, Reggie Sutton, I think, is the key. I thought he was really promising as a true freshman, as that blocking tight end role they used him at the end of the 2018 season, really banged up last year. I think if you can put him at guard because he's kind of bounced a all over the place with Raekwon O'Neal, you might have the, the forming of a really strong left side, and you got to figure out the other three spots. C.J. Hansen, I mean, we don't really know what the center depth chart's going to look like because, as you said, we don't have a depth chart. We don't have a roster. <laughs> we asked Oric a couple weeks ago, you know, what he was thinking. He wouldn't even provide names. So I think that's going to be a key spot as well. I think Hansel will go there. I know that he's a really athletic guy, but I, I think this, pro, this line is going to take a step back, just how it took a step back last year. And that's a scary thought when you consider what yeah. the line was last year. Right. So, sorry, do you, you see it the same way? Yeah, um, I agree. C.J. Hansen probably has the edge at, at, at center. Uh, keep in mind that, that, that you know this offensive line from a year ago allowed 26 sacks, um, which is middle of the pack in the Big Ten. But the, you know stats are deceiving because uh, just their their weakness um, you know, up front uh, you know caused uh, Nunzio when he was the offensive coordinator and, and John McNulty early on to really try to get the ball out you know, as quickly as possible, really couldn't go, go deep on, on, on a lot of passes and take shots down the field. Um, 
again, Sean Gleason's offense, maybe, you know, that it's going to be predicated on, on, on fast moving and, and maybe he can take it, you know, take advantage of, or, you know, at least make, make, make the offense's weak, weakness, not, not be a weakness overall on the offense, but certainly, you know, probably the biggest question mark on a team is the offensive line going in. All right, switch to the defensive side of the ball. Defensive line, this is one position where clearly uh, Greg Shannon knew he had to get some immediate upgrades and uh, and did that. I mean, we'll, we'll see how it pays off on the field, but certainly on paper. You, you've Cratch had it as uh, Tverdov and Mike Tverdov and CJ Onichi as the defensive ends, Mike Dwanfor and Julius Turner as the defensive tackles. That doesn't mean I'm surprised that Ireland Burke and Malik Barrow weren't in your projections, Cratch, but I know that's a position where, you know, you pretty much rotate guys in constantly during the game. Do you think this position is better than it was last year? I, I do. You know, the reason why I have Dwum for there is just because I think of, of the, the tackles they're bringing in when you consider the health issues Malik Barrows had. Um, you know, Ireland Burke, I think, is a guy who has I, – I would say Ireland Burke maybe has the most upside of the defensive linemen that, you know, not counting Aaron Lewis, the Williamstown kid, that – that Shiana's brought in, but I think Dwumfor is just the most accomplished college football player they, right. they got. So I think that's why I have him there. And this nose tackle, it's just Julius Turner's a guy who's, who's been very effective. You know, I, I don't know if he's a, a guy that you necessarily ideally want to have be your every down nose tackle, but I, I just look at this group and the body types and the positions they've played in the past and the present. And I think he's their best answer at nose, you know, from what we know about the roster. Right. Sorry. And, you know, the, the ends, obviously, Davertoff is going to be a Shiano guy. You can just know that that's a high motor, you know, high energy pass rusher that he's going to love. What do you think? Is this position better? Yeah, I, I, I think, again, that was if you're talking about the, the, the offensive line being the biggest uh, question mark, defensive line uh, on, on, on the defense is going to be the biggest question mark as well. They do you know, have the ability to maybe get after the quarterback a little bit more. Uh, CG, uh, C.J. Oneshi plays with an edge. I, you know, I, I know talking to uh, people inside the program, they all think that he's going to you know, maybe have his best uh, season to date. He's a senior. Um, you know, in, inside, I think that, that Graciano is going to try to, uh, you know, rotate as many, many as possible, maybe play as many as, uh, you know, four or five, uh, you know, players inside in, in the rotation. Mike Tverdoff, really, he, he's going to be the guy who I'm going to be looking forward to seeing the most. Obviously, uh, you know, his brother Pete, you know, played for Graciano. Uh, you know, he's the, he's the guy that, you know, from the beginning, you know, really convinced a lot of his teammates to kind of buy in on, on Greg Schiano, who we all know is, you know, going to be a guy who, who you know, is going to try to get the best out of, out of his defensive players. It might not be for everyone, but you need a guy like Mike Tverdoff to kind of, you know, sell his teammates and, and you know, on, on let's just buy in. So Mike Tverdoff, you know, I think he's going to have maybe uh, the biggest year to date. Linebackers, three seniors. I mean, this is inc- I mean, just given with this program over the last few years, just this is incredible, really, to, when you think about it. Uh, uh, and I think, you know, I sorry you mentioned earlier that there were two positions on the team where Greg Shannon felt he had big ten talent. I assume this is the other one. Uh, yeah. Tyshawn Fogg, uh, <clears throat> Ola Kunli. Fatu Kasi. I'm going to be able to pronounce that name before he graduates, I promise. Uh, and Tyreek Maddox Williams, uh, a group that struggled a bit in coverage, but certainly was pretty good against the run. Cratch, uh, is this an improvement or about the same, given you know, this was the same group last year? About the same. Yeah, I think that they'll probably be able to, maybe in a scheme, they'll be able to use these guys a little bit more effectively. If there's more of a pass rush up front, I think that's going to help them. I disagree. I think they're going to be a Sorry, lot better. I think they're, yeah, I think they're going to be a lot better. I think, uh, you know, linebacker is a type of position where you're talking about, um, you know, experience matters. And, you know, this is a very experienced core where, where you know, we left out. And I agree with the, you know, maybe the starting uh, lineup, but you left out Rashawn Battle, uh, Drew Singleton, uh, you know, Jennings. Uh, they're, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they have a lot of depth that, you know, uh, you know, in this linebacker core. Also keep in mind, Linebacker was always a strength, you know, you know, under Greg Schiano, whether it was, you know, the years that they had Ryan D. Imperio, Kevin Malice, uh, De- uh, Debron Thompson. I mean, and Greg Schiano was a former linebacker himself. So his linebacker cores are always better, uh, uh, really good. There's going to be a better unit than it was a year ago. Right. Secondary, I mean, I don't think there's any debate that this is, I mean, this is a much better group than a, Yo, or, yeah. or you, you're adding a Rose Bowl MVP to a group that already had a ton of promise. And I, I, if not a ton of depth, and of course, that's always the question in football. Do you have enough cornerbacks to, uh, to cover spread offenses? Uh, but Corner, you know, having Avery Young, Trey Avery, uh, Christian, uh, Izzy, is in, is, is he in, how do you pronounce his name? Sorry, Cratch. I believe it's Izzy in. Izzy in. Yep, and Brendan White. 
of course, coming over from Ohio State. Uh, uh, what do you think, Cratch? This, this has got to be something where they've really – dramatic improvements. No, definitely. I think dramatic improvement, and I think it's also really you're going to watch the, the coaching, um, you know, with Fran Brown. Because I, I felt, you know – when Chris Ash got fired last year, obviously we know Chris Ash was a defensive backs guy. I thought that unit really regressed once he was out the door. So I, I think that, you know, you're definitely going to see that happen. Sarge? Yeah, uh, depth is going to be the issue here. But, they, you know, if they keep these guys healthy, you know, it's a, it's a lot better just the starting four. And then, you know, you add in a Jared Paul, who I know uh, the coaching staff is high on as well. But the cornerback depth is, is going to be an issue. All right, guys, that's a pretty good roster breakdown. It was fun talking football, man. I knew we could do whoa, it. Whoa, 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 whoa. You want to do specialists, I mean, too? No, no, you're, you're forgetting. Like, we have, like, the PR guy for, for Adam Corsak on the line. Right. We, uh, you know, uh, is he still on the line? Uh, the PR guy for Adam Cor- Corsak, are, are you available? Calling yes, the PR I was, was going to say, uh, you know, Pulitzer said something about, you know, the Pacheco being the best player on the team. I, I think you spoke a little bit early there, Steve. I mean, oh boy, here we go. Here we go. All of the Australian listeners, let's hear it, Cratch. Adam Corsak will be better. I mean, here's, here's the thing because everyone's got the blanket eligibility waiver. And I was told there's, a, you know, Adam Corsak could have an argument to get his freshman year back because he went, you know, he was like a part time student in Australia. There's a possibility that the pandemic could have given us three more seasons of Adam Corsak punting at Rutgers. Think about wow. that. Well, that's just dreamy. I mean, that's what are you going to do? I mean, holy <laughs> crow. I mean, you're forgetting the fact that he could be a first-round pick and if he's going to be a first-round NFL That's true. NFL he, he, could, he could revolutionize the punting game in, in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> right. by, by the way, it, you know, if he does spend another three years, would, it, you know, would he be over 30 by, by, by the end of, by the time he graduates? Is Cratch, do you have an answer on that? I mean, Chris Wanky won the Heisman at 28. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Heisman votes for, for, for Rutgers punter. All right, let's get some uh, Rutgers insider questions, uh, guys. Appreciate, as always, subscribing, india.com backslash text. Uh, uh, Cratched in a nice uh, uh, yeah, mailbag with you guys today, so we'll, we'll, just, we'll just answer a few here in the last few minutes. Um, this is a good one. As you said, with tough without a roster and no spring practice or watching practices, any guess on a player who will have a surprise slash breakout season? Mm, that's a great question. I will go with... I'm going to go with Mike Tverdoff. I, I think that he's a guy who, as Sarge said, he's going to be the ultimate Shiano guy. And I think he's a guy who they were kind of asking to do things that weren't necessarily his strength in the old scheme. I think he's going to be as a, a tough as nails, you know, the def, traditional defensive end in this scheme. I think he's a guy who can have a breakout year. Sarge, you got one? Yeah, it's not sexy, but uh, Raekwon O'Neal, who, you know, finally, yeah. uh, you, know, I, you know, he played a lot last year. They're going to need the left tackle position to be a, a strength. Um, experienced, um, you know, I, I, I think you can uh, see, you know, if the offensive line gels the way they, they, they needed to gel, I think Raekwon O'Neal at left tackle is going to be uh, needed to, to, to really have a breakout. Yeah, and I will say I think someone's going to surprise us at receiver. I just don't know who it is. <laughs> so stay tuned for that one. Uh, another good question about the quarterbacks. Uh, I know Vedral and Art are the obvious choices as front runners, but I wonder, given the success of mobile quarterbacks in the NFL, Jackson, Murray, Mahomes, Wilson, et cetera, shouldn't Peyton Powell be given a legit shot? Cratch? That's an interesting question. You know, obviously, when, when we were going into spring football, the indication was that he was going to be given a shot, but we've lost so much time you know, A and B, that was before Vedral showed up. So I just wonder, like, you know, he's a guy who was at Baylor as a quarterback and left before even, you know, they even started their season because it became obvious that he was not going to play quarterback at Baylor. It seemed like he was, he, was, he was committed to Utah, and they didn't seem terribly, you know, thrilled about the idea of him being a quarterback long term. It was already kind of iffy when he came to Rutgers. I just think when you look at the holes this team has elsewhere, wide receiver, tight end, potentially in a secondary, I just wonder, now that you have Vedral and and art here is and you have Evan Simon who you're high on and you have Johnny Langan and you have Cole Snyder is it just the point where it's not worth it and you tell him hey you, you, we got to try you somewhere else so we can get you on the field and have you help the team right all right another question uh, uh has anybody been able to get Jonathan Holloway on the record after backtracking faster than my toddlers when the toothbrushers come out that's a pretty good <laughs> line uh I have to laugh at that one uh, the answer the short answer is no uh you know the longer answer <laughs> I know when they said the votes unanimous 
that it, it gives the impression that Holloway, who I talked to a couple of days before the vote, was pretty emphatic. He didn't think they should be playing football, that he, you know, suddenly, well, you know what, maybe we should. I honestly don't think that's the case. I talked to enough people around Rutgers who believe, uh, who made it very clear that Jonathan Holloway made his opinions known about, you know, playing football this fall during the pandemic. Uh, but, uh, you know, when there's a conference vote, you know, unlike what happened with Nebraska and Ohio State flipping out the last time, I, I think, you know, he rightly decided when, when, when things were going in that direction that, you know, what, they're, member, they're a member of the conference. Uh, and the statement they issued made it pretty clear that they have deep reservations. Sarge, you, you'd agree with that take, right? Yes, exactly. I think this is a guy who, who made it clear that statement, you know, it wasn't just us who, who perceived it as, as being a eh, maybe – um, but a lot of other national people actually thought, thought that statement was, was very, very uh, lukewarm with the idea of playing in that statement. Even though it didn't have Jonathan Holloway's name on it, it came from old Queens. Uh, certainly, you know, he, he, he approved it. So I think that statement spoke for itself. All right, one final question. Do you think a bad Rutgers season, let's say no wins and some, and some blowouts, will greatly impact Shiano's momentum? My feeling that most of the season's national focus will be on Ohio State, who makes the playoffs for the shortened season, cancel games, et cetera. You know, I totally, I totally agree. I just don't – I mean, it's – you know, obviously, he, Greg Shiano doesn't need to have a honeymoon. He's going he's gonna to last as, you know, as long as they play football if he wants to. But, uh, you know, trying to judge him off this season or, 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 you know, making any sort of big declarations about, you know, where – this program is headed based on these eight games Cratch, I think it's just, you know, that's hard. That's hard to do. I would say, yes, I agree. Um, it, it's very hard to do. I, I think, look, I don't think a, a winless season with a lot of blowouts would help him close out that 2021 class, which is, I think, is the most important thing he can do right now. And, and I think that's, you know, you wrote this column, you know, a couple of days ago. The biggest challenge he has is kind of framing this season, no matter what happens, keeping the ball moving downhill going into 2021 and close out that class, keep the fan base excited and energized, especially when the fan base can't really be touch you know reach out and touch the team much this year obviously and kind of move forward I mean this is kind of a freebie season so I think that's why I've written this if he frames it as a developmental year and we're going to play everybody and we're going to try to win football games obviously but we're also going to figure out what we have and look toward the future I think that's the best case for him and that's going to allow him to cushion a lack of success but that being said you can't go winless because if you go winless you're going to go into next year with the idea that you could set the (laughs) all-time Big Ten conference losses record you know streak you could surpass those horrible northwestern teams that seem like a a, a mythical tale at this point you know, you, you gotta you gotta at least get a win on the board and be competitive in some of these games sorry you want to take that one as the final thought here uh, first off I, 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 this will be my final thought before i get into that um it's just fun to talk about football, right? Uh, I mean, isn't it you know, great? Yeah. It is. It really, really is. Um, yeah, I agree with everything that Crash said. There's not a whole lot more to add. I will say that ultimately, um, you know, I think uh, you know, Graciano is not going to want to lose games. He's going to want want to to, to uh, you know at least get, uh, give themselves a chance. So I think early on, I think he might be playing right. the, the best players. But I think yeah, as the season you know starts to to, to gradually, I think. He'll have uh, expectations and, and realistic expectations and, and know and understand that it's all about 2021, 2022, um, you know, and, and beyond that, you know, in order to have success down the line, you're going to have to know what this roster is. All right, guys, that's all we got for today. Thanks for listening. Steve Cratch, sorry, signing off. 